Hello, everyone. Welcome to Encore, the show for and about Encore entrepreneurs by the Encore Entrepreneur Institute. We are here to discuss entrepreneurship for the small business. So let's get started. Our special guests for today are Eric Huber. Hi, Eric. Hello. Hello, he's Janet. A, he's a serial inventor of 12 licensed items, including the Germ Master, which cleans your kitchen with steam. It's really, really cool. We have Natalie Monaco, the inventor of CoverMe, which I really love. Is this easy bed making product. So if you're like me and you sleep really rough, she has the product for you. And we are also expecting Nancy Tedeschi. Nancy has a great story. She's the inventor of Snap It Screw and easy, simple eyeglass repair kit. So she is actually joining us now and we're going to invite her in. Hi, Natalie, how are you? Natalie, can you hear me? Oh, there she is. And I see hey, Nancy. I'm trying Hi, to Nancy. find you guys. I've been on my internet. Now I'm on my <laughs> iPad. Let me <laughs> oh, well that works, that works. We have a moving camera. But yeah. I just wanted to welcome you all. We were just welcoming everyone to the show. Natalie, how are you? Everything's Hi, good on your end, okay? And then we have Nancy, and we already said hello, Hi. Eric. So um, you all have really cool products and really great stories. So I, I'm, let's get started. We might as well jump right into it. I'm glad you all could join us. So let's start with each one of you telling me a little bit about your products and who you are. Just kind of briefly go and let the audience know what it is you've done. Let's start with Eric and we'll go down from Eric down to Nancy and over to Natalie this time. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Janice, for having me, inviting me to your show. This is a real honor. Um, yeah, as you said, I am a serial inventor. Um, I'm not sure what that means. I just know I have a lots, of, lots of inventions. In fact, I have a, a book of about 120 different, different products here. So um, luckily I found quite a few homes for many of the products. Um, but I, I do primarily more consumer products. So I have stuff in the kitchen area, the automotive aftermarket, um, just all sorts of different types of household, that kind of that kind of thing. So I just find myself uh, always coming up with ideas. And about probably eight years ago, I decided I'm going to try to do something with those and get out of my garage, get out of my man cave and go see if anybody likes my, my products. And luckily, so far, so good. Knock on wood. Um, it has been been a very good reception. I recently was um, elected to the board of directors of the United Inventors Association out of Washington, D.C., which for me as an inventor is a big honor. So I get to um, help other other inventors and kind of with the mission of, of inventor education. So that's that's a, a little bit about me. So. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And let's go down to Nancy. I'm so glad you could join us. I was getting a little worried about <laughs> you there, but I'm so glad you found a way. I'm Tell really, us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. I was trying to get you on my desktop, but I ended up finding my iPad. Um, that works. So anyway, I invented the Snap-It Screw back in 2008. It's actually an easy way to fix your eyeglasses. It's actually a screw that has a little guide on it that guides you in a hole, and then you just uh, screw it down and break it off. But I've recently developed the uh, Snap It for other applications. We're using them for automobile repairs, computer repairs, mm -hmm. putting together remote control cars and things like that. I have 28 international patents. Wow. I travel all over wow. the world. I've been I've gotten awards in Australia, in Dubai. I won a national inventors contest in the United States and uh my goal now is helping other inventors, and I travel to all kinds of universities and talk to uh, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, people who are looking to invent. I try to help them avoid some of the pitfalls that I fell into. Great. Okay. Wow. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, those pitfalls and how to avoid them. So we're going to be really interested in hearing what you have to say. And then we have Natalie with CoverMates. Please tell us about your product and about yourself. Yes, yes. So CoverMade um, is a product that I invented um, a few years back. Um, it's a line of bedding that's designed for easy bed making. So really it just started with me um, as a frustrated consumer. Every morning I would wake up in a rush and I would think, you know, there should be a, an easier way to make the bed because the way in which a bed is made has never really advanced. Um, so I just really got to thinking that, that, you know, there should be an easier way and I made it my mission to create a product that could facilitate the process. So essentially CoverMade's um, 
a comforter that has a hidden elastic that runs underneath the foot end of your mattress. Um, and it just keeps everything in place. So when you wake up in the morning, instead of the covers being a big mess or on the floor or, you know, halfway off the bed, the whole bottom half of the bed stays made. So you just have to pull up on that top part of the covers and throw your pillows on and you're good to go. So, um, Kind of long story short, um, Covermaid was brought to market in 2012, and um, we got the patent for it in 2013, and now it's available through Brookstone, um, Wayfair, Dawson, Maine, and um, coming very soon to Bed Bath & Beyond, which we're really excited about. That is exciting. Oh my goodness, congratulations on that. Thank you. Well, let, let me ask you, have any of you, when you first started out, have you, did you run into any scammy type companies that uh, wanted to take your money basically and they were unscrupulous? Raise your hand. <laughs> Has that happened to anyone? So yeah, they, I did. Yes. You did? Okay, well, let's start with Nancy and then we'll go back. We'll go up to Eric. Tell me your story. What happened? Okay, so um, when I, well, I have two good stories. One is uh, I actually gave a company $10,000. Oh, to, no. Yeah, to help me bring my uh, product to the market. And it sat there for nine months. They didn't do a thing. Uh, I ended up uh, threatening to sue them because they didn't do what they were supposed to. And I was a lucky one. I got my ten thousand dollars back. Oh wow! Oh good. Now, That's good. You know, the other part of the scamming part of this that isn't money related. It's people out there telling you that they can sell your product to uh, like a Walmart or any of the big retail box stores. They say that they have relationships and stuff with these people, but really they don't. They have uh, like 50 different products that they peddle around and yours is just one in their bag. So one yeah. of the things I like to tell people is don't let go of your products because if you give them away, they're not going to get the attention that they need to get to the marketplace. Right, right. Very good advice. How about you, Eric? Yeah, what that, have that you is found? <clears throat> That is so true. Uh, my big thing has, has been from the beginning is to spend as little money as possible and try to do as much of it on my own. I think inventing is a lot like um, you're managing your investments, uh, maybe the, uh, the um, automotive mechanic, your health care. You need to know enough about it and research and, and educate yourself self enough about it so that you know the questions to ask. You know that um, you know when you're being taken advantage of. Um, because you can't do it all yourself, like, for instance, patenting. Um, that can be a very, very tedious, tedious uh, process. So there are times when you will have to spend money, but it's just important that um, you spend it, you spend it you know, well and you spend it in the right places. So that's my, you know, my big advice is try to learn as much as you can. And like we were talking about, there's so much on the Internet. There's so much on YouTube. There's so many books out there. There's so many other inventors, inventor groups. There's so much out there that it's just important that you tap that. And I find that in, in our inventing community, we're, we're all pretty nice people and we all try to help each other quite a bit. So inevitably you can ask, um, ask almost anybody for some advice and you will probably get some, get that advice. So I think that's important. And that's why we're here today. So, and Natalie, were you clear of that? Did you not run into that when you were making I, I didn't. Um, I didn't. That's good. I didn't go to any of, of those companies. Um, you know, I just really think that you know, um, to add to what Eric said, it's just so important that for yourself that you learn as much as you can. So I got my hands on as many books as I could from the library about product development, and that prepped me so much when I was pitching to retailers and manufacturers and trying to find the right people and the right resources. Um, so I think you really have to empower yourself. And unfortunately, it would be great if we could all just call a 1-800 number and voila, you know, everything comes to fruition. But it's just, it doesn't happen that way. So, you know, I would just say that the best thing to do is become like a sponge. And one thing that I thought, thought was really great too is just look up other inventions and other inventors. And find out who's behind each product and how did they get it to market and every path to market is going to be different but you can at least learn from those inventors and their experience and apply what they did to your specific situation 
Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how Nancy was talking about getting, finding a licensee, in this case, Walmart. Walmart might be is a little bit different a story, but so many manufacturers out there, they're, they're looking for new products. And nowadays, um, there is a much more open innovation type of environment. It used to be in the olden days, companies just said, we do it ourselves. We, we develop our own products. We have our own R&D department. We can do it ourselves. Nowadays, they, companies are looking to their customers to help develop products. So in almost every case, well, I don't know what percentage, but you go onto their website and there is some sort of process for you to submit a product to them and for them to evaluate your product. Be sure you read everything carefully to be sure that um, you're not giving away your product, but there's, there's right. much more, they're much more open for, for new products nowadays. And if I may add just something to his sure. uh, statement is that you know, a lot of people will go through to companies, they'll go through the marketing departments. But what I found is I have more success going through research and development mm -hmm. departments in the company. I mean, I actually got into Walmart via the CEO of Walmart. Mm -hmm. That's so, fantastic. Yeah, the traditional way of doing business isn't the right, you know, isn't necessarily the only way to Absolutely. do business. So when people, you know, in marketing and sales, People are looking to sell their products. They're not looking to bring in the new product. So mm -hmm. I really have had so much, uh, a lot of good success with research and development. Well, that's a good tip. Thank you for that. Because uh, I don't think people all, often think of that. They want to do the traditional route that they read about. And, and you know, that doesn't always work. So sometimes we have to find a back door. And, and uh, those these types of tips are definitely going to help. So Natalie, you mentioned that there were different ways to get your product to the market. Is there a best practice for doing that? Because we just had Nancy talk about doing it with, by uh, contact. She, somehow, how did you get in contact with the CEO of Walmart too? We need to come back to that. But is there a best practice to getting your product to the market? I think it's different for every situation. I think it really depends. I don't think there's one, you know, perfect path or set of, you know, guidelines um you kind of just have to keep beating down doors until you find the way that is, is yours well tell us how did you do that um for me it was a lot of hearing no <laughs> and a lot of just really being passionate and believing that i had a solution and if even people didn't get it at first i just wanted to keep at it and i just really it's just passion when you believe in something so much um it propels you to keep going forward um and i think you know the the ways that you can submit products on some sites you usually just get lost in in the, the shuffle so yeah. for me i went directly to, i would i call it cyber stalking <laughs> but i would find the buyer find out who that person was via linkedin or just the internet and just find directly the person that would handle intake of my type of product for home textiles and um, i would just diligently you know try to get into that person's email address. You know, I would guess their email address, all different combinations until it went through. As a matter of fact, that's how I got into Brookstone. Is I didn't I couldn't I didn't know their email format. So I just kept guessing and it all ended up working out. So you just have to be aggressive and you just have to be creative and you have to believe in in what you're offering. I, yeah, I love these innovative ways. How about you, Eric? Do you have a go to way of getting your product to the market? Well, a lot of a lot of times I'll go through the store shelves. I'll walk through a store and say, "Hey, where does my product fit within their, you know, within the, these product in these store shelves?" And I look for the manufacturers that have much of the real estate on those shelves. Turn over the product, find out the name of the company, and and often you can find you can find out quite a bit, as you were saying about um, cyber stalking them through LinkedIn. And there's some really good ways to to contact contact the people but um for me it's yeah it's the store shelves and trade shows i love trade shows walking awesome. a trade show and just um talking talking to people about you know about product development and you've got to be real careful not to be pushy it's very important that us inventors are professional and there's yeah. nothing worse than somebody there is there is confidence and that's very important but when they hear you know i've the got the best product in the world. It's going to make you millions. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Everybody's <laughs> going to want it. It's like, uh oh, red flag. So this right, is one of those right. psycho inventors. So you just need to be sure that you're professional and respect of their time and, and what their, you know, their position. So. Okay. The other thing I, I would like to add something about the trade oh, shows. Yeah. Because 
a lot of people think that going to a trade show with your product is going to cost you a lot of money by renting a table or whatever. But, you know, what I found very helpful at trade shows, one, like he said, you have to be respectful because people that are at trade shows exhibiting are there to sell their own mm -hmm. products. They're not there to sell our products. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is find a place where your product might fit into a company and pick up some business cards because everybody has their cards there. Mm -hmm. So don't really hassle them at the trade show. But when you get home, you get a stack of cards and then you can start uh, uh, emailing people, calling people. Just by that has helped me tremendously. Yeah, where I didn't spend any money at all to go to the trade shows other than to get there. Mm -hmm. Wow. What, what are some of the big trade shows for inventors? Can you tell us a little bit about them? Or do you have some favorites? There's it depends on what, yeah, it depends on what the product is. Wait a minute, hold on one time. Let's go ahead. Let, let's Natalie go and then we'll come back around. We'll circle back around. Sorry. Um, I was gonna say Impex is is one that's in Pittsburgh. I did that one a few years okay. back. And that was successful for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was really when I was the product was in its infancy and um, I really just got a lot of good feedback that helped kind of just give me direction on, on what my next steps were. Okay. And how about you, Nancy? You were gonna say well, I think it depends on your product. Like, um, you know, I went to the houseware shows with Snap It, and I did tremendous there. But there are, you know, there, there are electronic shows. There's tech shows. There's houseware shows. I went to a Vision Expo, which mm -hmm. is in New York. So I think it really is based on what your product is and where you're trying to bring it into the market. Okay. And, and Eric, did, have you found one that you had m much success or...? Yeah, I agree. A lot of times I'll look for a particular manufacturer that I'm interested in presenting my product to and find out what shows they go to. And yes. to me, that, that kind of helps helps me to learn about their industry. Um, but for the areas that I, I tend to invent in, I often will go to the National and uh, the National Hardware Show is a big one for mm -hmm. me. And the Automotive Aftermarket Show is another big mm -hmm. one for me. And then I went just went to CES for the first time. And that's going to be uh, an annual thing. Oh, my gosh amazing so there's just you know those are the types of shows that i i tend tend to go to okay and so, at those trade shows and eric will know this is that they have inventor sections in mm -hmm, trade that's shows right, yeah. where where you can actually bring uh or contact the people who are running these inventor corners and these trade shows mm -hmm. you can actually for a fraction of the cost you can display your product with other new inventions and a lot of the trade shows will actually have competitions and awards yeah. i actually won the national hardware Award oh is that right cool. Trade oh, cool for the best retail product that year so there's ways to get inside the trade shows that will actually benefit you as an inventor because there's different sections you can go to yeah and on That's the um the nash the um the uh uh Inventor Association that I'm on the board of directors of, they often will sponsor some of those um, those sections that you're talking about. So that's the, yeah, that is a great way to get get your product in a in a less expensive way. And there's a lot of the buyers come by those sections because they're anxious to see the the new products. So yeah, and then with the awards and such, that's a great way to get uh, recognition. It's fantastic. I just want to quickly go back to that story with Nancy and the CEO, CEO. of Walmart. Uh, not Walmart. Of Wal was it Walgreens or Walmart? Walmart. 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 Oh my gosh! You have to tell us how that happened because I'm sure other people would love for that to happen to them. So please tell us that story. Well, it's very outside of the box, so <laughs> it'll, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and make a long story short. So Walmart has a contest every year. It's a um, a video contest. It's a social media driven contest where they will uh, it, they will allow you to submit your invention to this contest. It's called Get on the Shelf. They had 5,000 applicants and it's all social media driven. So you have to get your own votes. Oh. So you're up against 5,000 products and you have to have the most votes. And at the end, they take the top 10 and then they do it again. And they t at the end of that, they take the top three. So I and my assistant dressed up as screws <laughs> and went to New York City. We went to New York City and we, we were walking around the city giving out cards, having people text our, our text number to the social media. We ended up winning. We, we were one of the top three winners. <laughs> wow. And I ended, up, nice. I, I ended up getting on Good Morning America and the Today Show. And I actually have a sign with um, 
Lester Holt holding up my get on the <laughs> shelf with my text number that he put on TV that day. But anyway, at the end of that, Walmart invited us out to um, um, Bentonville. They actually paid for us to go out there and they had asked us the three winners to speak at one of their employee meetings. So I, the CEO introduced me to, to this audience. And afterwards I said to him, how do I get on your shelves? <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, you're not on the shelves here. And I go, no. And no. one thing led to another. And he was the one that ended up getting oh, me on the shelves. Wow. That's that was a cool. fantastic story. Oh my gosh. You talk awesome. about innovative marketing. <laughs> yeah. I would love yeah. to see those pictures of the, you guys dressed up as giant screws. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. And that's a, that's a good example of why these, these big invention promotion companies just don't work. No one's going to have the passion of the inventor. I mean, that, that exactly. type of, you know, that type of grassroots marketing and that excitement, no one's going to have that. No one's going to feel that other than the inventor himself. So absolutely, great job. Great job. I I agree. I totally agree. So let's talk about the uh, going to market a little bit more because you see as a consumer all these products, and I know some of you guys have it on your products as seen on TV. How does that work? How do how do you? I mean, is, if it, does anyone get to use as seen on TV if they're on TV? How does it work? As long as you're on one TV commercial. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, yeah, and a, a TV commercial that you can pay for yourself too. I mean, you right. can have your put exactly. yourself on the as seen on TV. As seen on TV, um, that's an area that if you're an inventor and you have some little teeny products, it, that is what I call the lowest hanging fruit. It's the easiest to get on because they are thirsting for more product. They're thirsting for product. It's not the easiest to get, I shouldn't say to get on a commercial, but it's the easiest to be looked at because they are looking for products left and right. And so I've had, I think, a dozen products tested on TV and have not yet had one that tested all, it made all the, went through all the testing and made it to, you know, full national rollout. So, but it's very, it's a good, it's a good way to start in the inventing world to practice. But I got another tip here because okay. <laughs> I was, I actually went on the As Seen on TV shelves and see my products an eyeglass repair kit. Nobody is going to go to the As Seen on TV shelf looking for an eyeglass repair right. kit. Right. So that was a mistake that I made mm -hmm. by allowing it to go into those right. channels when my yeah. product belonged in the vision section of the store. So mm -hmm. there's so many different avenues to look at when you're really talking about as seen on TV. If you have a gimmick product that isn't long term standing and it's like a 24 month product that's mm -hmm. going to go in and out like a fad, that's where you want right. to be. Yep. Right. If, you have long, if you have longevity in your product, mm -hmm. you don't want to be there. Yeah. Right. I have, um, I've talked extensively with some people in the as seen on TV business um, from the Electronic Retailing Association. Um, and for my product, and I would never have realized this before I got into inventing, but because I have so many SKUs for my comforters, because we have, we have twin, we have queen, we have king, and then they each come in down and down alternative fill. They're looking for one SKU that they can just move all day long and comforters are also large to ship. So those two factors being that there wasn't just one SKU and that it's a larger item to ship don't you know that i would never have get thought that beforehand but now it really makes sense to me as to what what they're really looking for 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 those as seen on tv items and also the price point yeah yeah okay. it's, a, it's a very narrow demographic it's a narrow price point you have to have yeah the shipping and there's so many elements that make just that right that right product okay awesome. well talking about mistakes can you think of like one of your biggest mistakes that a lot of other inventors or people who are bringing new products to market might make is it that you can share with us who would want to go first <laughs> hmm. how about you start? eric where to start where to start <laughs> um i think a, a lot of people make the mistake as i did i should i should talk for myself um make the mistake of of committing too much too quickly to a product and you want to be sure before you spend a lot of money, a lot of time, you want to be sure of a, there's a there's a few things in place first. And so one of it is, is there a market for your product? And I think a lot of people get so passionate about their product, they forget to, to look around and see if there maybe is already a better solution out there or even a bit, you know, that product, your product might be already out there or it might be patented or it might be, you know, talked about. So I think that's important is don't don't spend money 
don't spend a whole lot of time until you do a lot of a lot of research on your product. And sometimes that's hard as an inventor because we are so involved in our product; it's our baby. That I find yeah. it. I find it better to um, have others do that for me. In fact, I have a deal with my son that if he finds my product, either in patents or online or something, I will give him a, a reward. I'll give him some cash because I want I want my product to be found quickly so I don't waste any more time and money. So that would be my How old advice. is your son? He's 21 now. So. Oh, you know, okay. It's that's cool because my, my, my eight-year-old grandson is starting to do it now. So that that's All fun. Right. That's fun. So my son, my son works for Snap It. He just opened an office cool. in London. He's, oh my god. So gosh. he's living in London now. We just opened an office. He went there two days ago. Cool. Oh wow, congratulations. I, I think it's neat when you can actually work with your family because not everyone can do that. <laughs> but it's great when you can. The other so, thing that I'd like to add to Eric's uh, um thing that one of the mistakes that I made, and I think a lot of people make, because you don't really think about the agreements that you're signing. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you sign an agreement, like with a sales rep that wants to rep your product, or with somebody who wants to help you do a prototype, or anything where you're getting into a, con a contractual agreement with somebody, make sure you're not giving them money up front for a job make sure that whatever job you're contracting them for is spelled out explicitly. Like, okay, I'm going to give you $5,000, but this is what you're going to do for that $5,000. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a performance tied to the contract because a lot of people will just take your money and not do anything with it. So what is it? that's a lesson I learned the hard way. Yes, and just to add to that, I would say that there might be times where you – should really just send it to an attorney, even though you're thinking, geez, it's $300 an hour for me to send this to my attorney to have them look at it. But in the long run, and for the peace of mind, a lot of times, it's if you're not sure, it's probably a good idea to do that. I agree with that, too. Now, how about you, Natalie? Have you uh, have made any big mistakes that you think others might make in um, the process? Not, I don't know if it's necessarily a mistake, but I would say in the, in the beginning, I was naive into thinking that, well, I've never seen anything like my invention, like my idea, so it must be patentable. So, if, you know, if you look in stores and you look online like I did, and I'm like, well, there's nothing like this out there, so I must be able to get a patent. It's so much more complex than that. And so when I did go and start working with my patent attorney, and she, I, we did our, you know, professional patent search where she did, did the search, and she uncovered a stack of patents that were related to easy bed making that was two inches thick. And I, my jaw hit the floor because I'm like, wow, like I, I just never would have thought that there were that many patents. So in a way I was like excited because that showed me that it was a, a viable problem that people had been trying to solve. So I liked seeing that, but at the same time, it was a lot of, you have to go through each and every one of those because potentially they could prevent you from getting your patent if they, if they do conflict and you know, that's, that's a whole other conversation because it's right. very complex, but I would just say, you know, don't just think, cause if you don't see it somewhere, your idea that it's patentable because there's a lot that goes into what qualifies as as patentable. Okay. Now, go ahead. You want to say something, Eric? I was just going to say, you know, and something about patents too. Um, we often put a lot of focus on patents because that that's kind of gives us our our little monopoly for a while and it allows us to invest into something mm -hmm. and, and keeping others from from using our our idea. But understand that 80% of the products that are on uh, in the market do not have a patent. Mm -hmm. and, in, wow. and only 5% of patented products are even commercialized. So mm -hmm. just because you get a patent doesn't mean you're gonna have success. And I think a lot of right. people need to, people need to remember like that. Right. Yeah. Right, if I could just right. if I could just get my patent, I'll be a, you know I'll be a huge yeah. success. But that's not. I think this stat is only two out of every three thousand new product ideas make it to market. So something like you said, I mean, it's a very very small right, percentage. Right. So yeah, and, it's and not a guarantee. I see. I see. Be careful what you wish for when you get a patent too, because I am right now in a patent infringement case out of Boston. Oh no. I've spent a half a million dollars already oh defending a, comp a company who um, has stole my idea. So getting a patent is one thing, but make sure when you're getting your patent that you know exactly what you're getting. Because if you're not willing to defend it, right. don't yeah. even bother going to and getting it. Makes sense. 
it, it, I mean, a lot of people go, I'm going to get a patent so nobody else can sell it. No, that's not what it's about. It's about, well, you get your patent, but you have to be willing to defend it. Because yeah, yeah. no one's going to go after that person. It's all on you and your... Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question because I've uh, talked to a lot of entrepreneurs with products and one of the biggest problems, and we did a show about this um, uh, not too long ago, about protecting your product, especially from overseas counterfeiting. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you, how do you guys, how did you avoid that so far? Does I, anyone... I, I'm suing a company in China right in now. In China. Wow. Yeah. So I have my factory in China and there's two other factories mm -hmm. over there that are making fake product now there's 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 something to be Perfect. said for it though because if somebody's doing it then you have a great idea yeah right so you have to you have to take it as a little bit of a compliment <laughs> but you can't be afraid to to uh to expand your marketplace because of people coming in to infringe your patents you just you know fear will right. stifle you and stop you in your tracks Absolutely. you can't you can't think that way like Right now, I'm suing a company in Germany, one in Boston, and three in China. So, wow. and it, because you know my product is little, it's easy to manufacture, it's mm -hmm. easy to get here, and people want to use it. So, you know, be getting the patent is one thing; defending it is way worse than getting. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and a good example of why why besides possibly losing sales and such um, when you're knocked off or the counterfeiting is, well, for instance, the hoverboard. Um, the people who had the patent on the hoverboard did, did quite well, but then all these cheap knockoffs came and they started catching on fire. And now that whole industry right. has a bad name because of these cheap knockoffs. So that's often an issue is the knockoffs are an inferior quality to yours. And so that affects your, your reputation and your product. Right. Oh, absolutely. Well, let me ask you, well, we have a question before I go to my next Got question it. from the audience from Tim Burt Media. And I don't know if any of you can answer this question because I'm not a patent professional. We, he should ask this when I had the attorney on that was a patent attorney. But would you explain the difference between a utility patent and a provisional patent? It's, can anyone talk to that? Go ahead, Eric. Okay. Well, <laughs> provisional, there is no such thing as a provisional patent. It's a provisional patent application. And so what that is, is that that is an application that kind of it holds your place. It gives a, a date for when you file your real patent, the utility patent, you can go back and use that previous date from the provisional patent in your, your real, if you will, patent. So a provisional patent is a great tool, especially now with the, um, our, our patent system has changed to first to file from first to invent. So it's very important now that there is a um, there's a paper paper trail there, and so filing a provisional patent is that way of protecting yourself before you go and get your your full patent, and it gives you a year to basically see if you have merit in your product, and it's a great way to go, and you can write it yourself. It costs sixty five to one hundred and thirty dollars, and it's it's wonderful. And the and yeah, and a, a provisional patent. Isn't there's no such thing as a provisional patent, like Eric said. It's a provisional patent application, and it okay. does hold your place. And then you can put on your product patent pending, mm -hmm. so it puts people on notice That's that you are intending to apply for a full fledged utility patent. Yeah. All right. That's good well, information. The other thing is, is like um, Eric said, it, it holds your place, so it gives you that year to work on changing, making any changes that you might need to make before you invest all the money in the utility patent because you don't want to, I actually have an inventor friend that did that and he, after he applied for his utility patent, he realized that he had some major changes mm. to, make to his patent and he, could, he couldn't afford to um, to revise it. So mm. that's what that, that time period gives you some time to do some, maybe some more prototyping. Okay. Okay. I just put up a link for anyone who's watching live. So this is just about the scam part that we talked about earlier and it's the United States mm -hmm. Patent and Trademark office, they have a whole resource there for any kind of scams and venture scams that you can actually report. And that's the link there. Um, so if you need that, you can just copy and paste or just click on it. Now, let me ask you three. I know I'm an entrepreneur and it's so difficult. You know, you all have this passion. So I know my passion keeps me going. Was there ever a point that you just wanted to quit and say, maybe I, I should just go get a nine to five. And can you tell me about that? And, and so Nancy's shaking her head. So let's start with Nancy. Go ahead. 
Well, this is a, this is a fun. That's a good question because I actually did quit at one point in time. I had taken. I had. I had worked for about three years just getting my patents at, uh, around the world and stuff. And I got so frustrated trying to get it get it to the market that, that you know everybody thinks. The idea is the easy part. The rest of it is mm -hmm. the hard part. Right. Execution so, is the hardest. So I put mine in the closet and I was sitting at my desk one day and it was there for about six months. I didn't touch it because I was so depressed and so upset about how hard it was and difficult. But actually, that's given me my passion now to help other people. But one day I was sitting at my desk and believe it or not, my glasses broke. <laughs> Perfect. And I went into the closet and I took out one of my kits and my glasses were fixed in like 10 seconds. And after that, I said, oh, my God, I got to get this back <laughs> out there. But it is a lonely, frustrating, depressing yes. Yes. road to hoe. Wow. <laughs> wow. So do that it's easy is now it's very hard. OK. And how about you, Natalie? I was just going to say, it's a roller coaster. So part of the biggest test of, you know, going the, throughout your journey is can you um, manage kind of the emotional roller coaster that, you know, you're going to hear no and you're going to feel like sometimes you're not moving forward. But if, even if you're still crawling, you know, you're, you're still moving forward. And then, you, you know, you'll look back and be like, wow, look how far I really did come, you know. Uh -huh. That's great. How about you, Eric? Yeah, you know, one thing I always uh, talk to my inventor friends about is be realistic, have realistic expectations, because there are there are times when it might be time to say stop, might be time to say I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're very passionate about our products, but we need to be realistic. And there there's often a, a time where you just have to say, I need to cut my losses. I need to cut my losses. I've already, you know, I've already refinanced the home. I've already taken out of the 401k. I've already, you know, the college education for the kids is gone. So you, you really, there's a lot of big decisions that have to be made. And that, that's probably the toughest part is making those decisions. And especially if you don't have your family behind you and some things like that. Mm -hmm. My biggest problem has always been, and I just so respect you guys who can, you can take a product and just go right, right at it. I, my problem is focus. And so that, you know, that is my issue. I'll be working on a product and I'm, I'm getting close to market. And then I have this inventor ADD and I'm like, oh, I just got another idea. And I love this idea. And, you know, it's like it's shiny or something. You know, it's like the, the dog that sees something shiny. And so I just have to have my slap myself and have my friends around me, my inventor friends to say, stop it. Put it right in your book and focus. And that's that's been my biggest challenge lately is to remain real focused and 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 do as you two have done and to really get something way far like that. So kudos. That's, great. that's interesting. Well, let's talk about money a little bit. So you have this great idea. Where did you, if, if I can ask you to tell your story, because I know everyone's story is different, but where did you find the money to get started? Maybe with your first product, um, Eric, because you have so many, but how do people finance these things? You know, I talked a little bit before the show about my mother who wants to be an inventor. She tells me all the time, I have this great idea. And I, I keep saying she's throwing them at me for me to do it, but I'm not an inventor and I don't want it, but she has some really great ideas. You know, I'm yeah. like, well, that's, that's probably needed. I would use that. But, um, she, you know, the, the thing is she doesn't have the money to get started. So where do people find this startup money? Anyone want to jump in and answer that question? How did you get started? I mean, I will say for me, um, it was just bootstrapping everything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, I didn't want to put a lot of money into it. And for a long time, everything that was coming in just rolls right, right back into investing in and moving forward. Um, so I think you have to be very resourceful and you have to look for ways to save. You know, obviously, if you're not, you know, a huge big box retailer yourself or a huge company, you know, you're going to have to um, – Really, really be creative, but it teaches you to be to be savvy. I, I would think that would happen a lot with um, inventors, as it does with entrepreneurs, that you're bootstrapping to you just success to you're successful. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. How, about you, how about you, Eric? Yeah, I, I think it, it depends on your product and such too. Often, I am. Um, I can get, I have a, a knack to be able to prototype my products. And sometimes it's out of paper mache or duct tape. I love sewing. So a lot of my products are cut and sew um, stuff wow. like bags and, and different things. But it, it, it tends to be, um, it, it's different with everybody. So often my case, I, I look for a licensee 
And part of my agreement is that they pay for the patent, for instance. They pay for mm -hmm. product development, but I will get a, a lower royalty in many cases, but I share mm -hmm. more of that with them. The other way is I try to bring in people um, on the, to reward them on the back end through a royalty split of some sort. So bringing in an engineer or bringing in an attorney and saying, hey guys, I know this is a big risk, um, but I want you on board and at the end we'll share in the profits together. And that is a, that's a good way to, to, um, to have people on board with some vested interest. But you have to be able to know these people and know you can work with these people and know their work ethic and everything else. So it takes just that right team. But that, again, I'm coming from a little bit different standpoint because I'm a you know multiple idea kind of person versus you guys. You don't want to give up your equity. You, you guys want to stay, you know, what? stay focused. That, that's very important. So well, I actually brought my product to the market myself, mm -hmm. but then I licensed it. Mm -hmm. sure. So I got, wow. I, got a lot, I got a lot more money up right. front yeah. and I got a lot bigger royalty because I didn't want to stay in the business of selling screws. It's not my passion. Mm -hmm. I know everybody laughs when I say that, but I brought it to the market and showed the potential of my product. And then I went, now I'm licensing it around the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I developed the United States market, licensed it here, and now I'm over in different parts of the world. Absolutely. But with that said, there's Kickstarter. There's there's a lot of funding sites out there that if, I mean, I had a friend, you know, the guy who, have you guys seen the product, the balloon product, mm -hmm. where it blows up 100 balloons at one time? What? No. <laughs> it's an outdoor water balloon thing that he developed, and he put it on Kickstarter. He raised over a million dollars yep. in 30 days. Wow. Yeah. So if you have the right platform for a Kickstarter or Quirky or one of the, the crowdfunding, it's a great way to go. That's great advice. Great advice. So I know nothing about an invention product. Tell me a little bit about how does how do royalties work? I know how it works for me as an author, <laughs> but how does that work? Can you explain it to the public who are like me? Is it the same? Is it a standard across the board? Like I'm twenty percent for like I know models get twenty percent. Uh, you know how does is it a standard like that industry wise? Or? Well, you 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 negotiate your royalty. So, okay. but I get a royalty based on the gross amount of sales. So, however they sell, I get a percent of whatever they sell, and it's pretty. It's pretty cut and dry because there's nothing to deduct from it. Whatever their sales are, I get a percentage of. Okay. But um, everybody has, I mean, I've seen people with a royalty of 2% and I've seen royalties of 20%. So mm -hmm. it depends on how good your product is, what kind of market share you have by the time you're negotiating it. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to drive up your royalty rate. Yeah. And in some industries, they're historically low, like we were talking earlier about as seen on TV. That tends to be a lower on the lower end, usually a one to three percent royalty. But then mm -hmm. uh, then, yeah, depending on how far along, how much market validation you have, you can go go up to. Yeah, up to. I've never heard 20 percent. That would be amazing. But um, right. well, I, I have double digits. I are you serious? Uh, see, that's unusual. Right. That's good for you. Usually I say it, yeah. you know, it's more like three to seven percent is kind of the the going the going rate, but yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. Double yeah. digits. Yeah. How about you, Natalie? Cause you're going, you're doing all these big box stores. How does, mm -hmm. how do the royalty process work with those? Um, I actually, when I brought my, I did kind of the opposite um, of what Nancy was saying. So I initially licensed my product to a bedding manufacturer and that worked out really well because they were um, really involved in the prototyping process and they uh, you know took on a lot of that cost and they actually connected me with um, the manufacturer that is in China that still produces my product but once I saw that we were gaining traction and the product was selling I decided that I didn't want to license it anymore and um, I wanted to kind of take the reins myself so like I said, my my situation was kind of opposite to hers. You know, and that brings up something that's very important too in in these licensing agreements is that you have provisions in there that if they're not performing, you get that back because there's right. nothing yeah. worse than than you you licensing to somebody and they, and like we've talked earlier, there's they don't have that same passion often and they have a lot of business decisions to make and it's out of our control. But you want to be able to get that back if they're not performing. So you can go find another licensee, take it to market yourself or all sorts of things. 
-hmm. And you've got, and you can put, you can put actually yearly uh, their performance. If mm -hmm. if you want them to have to sell five hundred thousand dollars worth of your product a year, you write that right into yep. the agreement. So you give them targets too. It's not a one way street. So if yeah, they no. don't perform like, like you want them to, then you can get out of the contract. Yeah, and the beauty in those is there's often yeah, like we're talking about the um, a minimum royalty amount that if they don't hit those targets, they can still pay you to make up that difference to keep the rights to that product. So, which is mm. kind of neat. So even if your product isn't selling right. yet, perhaps, right. they can still pay you as if it has been selling. And that's that's a beauty, beautiful position to be in. Right, right. Now, this invention process is a very long ordeal. I know people who don't do it think, oh, I have an idea. It's going to be on the market in the next few months. It doesn't quite work that way, right? So just tell me a little bit, like maybe Eric, your favorite product or how long does it take? How long did it take you um, with each of your stories? Because I'd like to find out that information. Like, For me, I... I I'm not real fast, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I tend to take, I think, a little bit longer than most, but for, I, I feel it's very difficult to get a product from the idea stage to market, and you guys correct me if, you're wrong, if I'm wrong, but three years. Three years for me is, seems to be a pretty typical, because it's a, it's a long process for you know the due diligence, the patent work, all the design work, the engineering work, the uh, testing, the you know on and on and on. It can take a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that because I was at right at about two and a half years. So yep. I guess that's right. Good to know. How, how about you, Nancy? Well, I was, I was a little bit luckier. I, I, I uh, really started pushing my product in um, the end of 2009 and I got my first agree, uh, distribution agreement in January of 2010. So wow. I was pretty lucky. When did it hit the market? How, how long after that did it take to start selling? Well, um, it, the first, I mean, I was I was selling to the optometrist first, mm -hmm. so because all the opti opticians in the country are using my Smart. screw now, right. so I actually went to that market before I went to the retail market, and it took off like crazy. That's I great. mean, the first year I had really strong sales, so I was lucky. That's great. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. I love that idea. So, can each of you give a tip to our audience? Um, to help them get started. We might have some budding inventors out there that are just, you know, trying to find their way through this whole process. I was hoping that you each could give them something really good that they can take home with them. So can you think of something and, 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 and give your wisdom? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I know, I know. Okay. Wait, um, who said that? Okay. I, I think the most important piece of advice that I would give somebody who had an invention was to find a, a mentor who's mm, actually great, placed a product on the shelves of a store. Because, you know, a lot of people are out there saying they're these successful inventors or, and they haven't really done much. So do your homework, find your, I mean, there's people like us out here that will help. I'm helping a couple in Michigan right now with a, an invention. I mean, there are people that are willing to help, but make sure the people that you get to help you have a good track record. No, that's very good advice. Very good advice. Okay. Do you want to go next, Natalie? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, it always comes back to you are the driver. No matter what partners you have, you'll find yourself always having to push people along. Um, and, you know, you have to maintain that. So, you know, it, it all comes, has to come from you. So it's, it's all driven by that passion. Okay. And Eric? Yeah, I, I would agree. Education, educate yourself and learn as much as you can. Meet people, have mentors, read, do, you know, learn as much as you can on your own about it. And so that the decisions that you make, you have some sort of background for those decisions that I would really recommend that. And do your research on your particular product too. Don't get emotionally tied to it. I've, I was giving a, a talk at an event and, and someone asks, asked me, you know, what, what product did you love the most? And I said, I don't love any of my products. That's up to the market to decide. I, I, I want my products to be something that others love. I don't necessarily love it myself. And it kind of took them back. But my point basically is don't get too attached to, to your product. You need to be able to take an open mind and look at things from, from, the, from the consumer standpoint. Okay. No, this is all great advice and what a great show. 
Uh, you guys have really just contributed so much information that I think will help a lot of people out who are just getting started with their ideas for an invention and, and just to see what other people have gone through. So we're pretty much at the end of the show, but uh, if we have any questions in the audience, just this is the time to ask. But before we go, I just want each of you to have the opportunity to tell where we can find your products. So let's start with Eric, since you just finished up and just tell us about some of your products, because I know you have a lot and, and just tell us where they are pretty much based, where we can find them. Well, the best place is just is to go to my website, uh, vonhuber.com. Uh, that's that's a good place to start. And my stuff right now, I had some stuff on the market, then it came off the market. Now we're trying to get it back on the market. It's just been this ebb and flow that's that's really been it's re really been interesting. So that's why I love hearing your guys' stories about you know you're you're going gangbusters and just hit, hitting it hard. My my stuff, I've had some kind of stalls and now I'm going back and so back and forth but I have a new product that's going to be on the market here real soon in the um, personal defense area and another one that's a kind of more of a novelty item with smartphones so that's something I'm, I'm really excited that's going to be on the market here shortly so oh that is that is exciting so I, I, I can't wait to find out about it I hope I can <laughs> stay in touch and, and learn about what you guys are doing okay how about you Nancy uh, I'm in a lot of. Re I'm in a, a container store, Office Max, Office Depot, Walmart, Ace Hardware. I'm in a lot of the retail stores, but you can also find my product and a lot of information about me and my speaking engagements and where I go to help other inventors at SnapItScrew.com. Great. All right. Thank you. And Natalie. Um, CoverMadeBedding.com, and um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Brookstone, uh, Jocelyn, Maine, Wayfair, um, and coming soon to Bed Bath and Beyond. That's fantastic. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming on Encore, the show for entrepreneurs ages 50 plus. I really appreciate you taking your time out to do that. If you can just tweet on the left-hand corner of your screen, that will bring people, that will actually will tell them about our replay. So, and it will capture this gift that you see of us right now talking to each other and post it on your social media. I would really appreciate it. You can always come back to this link to see the video once it's done. So I just want to say once again, thank you. And you have helped a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. <laughs>